guys, I'm Hi. Marta Nielsen with USU Extension. I'm Sheridan Hanson with USU Extension. We're super excited to answer some of your gardening questions today. So our first question came in from Marianne Barton. And okay. She said, how do I keep ants out of my garden? We've got major tunnels already established. This is a hard one because ants love dry environments. And here in Utah, we are a dry environment. That's what we have. They like that dry soil. The best thing that you can do right now is to use a bait. And you want something that um, the ants are going to come to, they're going to take back to the colony. So like you can use things like diatomaceous earth if you're trying to be organic, but that's not something they're gonna take back to the colony. If you take a bait back, it will eventually get passed around to everyone and it will kill the queen, which is what's mm -hmm. gonna take care of that big problem. Are ants a problem in the garden? They're not really a problem. In fact, they kind of aerate our soils and lighten up the soils, but if it's a nuisance to you and you don't like having them there, then you can definitely take care, take of, them. care of that. Okay, so our next question is from Jennifer Jo Wandel. Wandel. Mm -hmm. She said, I, I moved to an area that has clay soil, and that's a pretty common problem in Utah, right? It is. It is. She said, I've heard that I can't really grow much in it. Is there anything I can do that doesn't require bringing in a lot of soil that isn't a weed. If I do bring in different soil, do I need to have a barrier between it and the clay soil? Okay, so like Marta said, in Utah we do have a lot of clay soils, especially if you're lower in the valley. So this becomes a big problem um, for some of us. So the problem with clay soils is that the water doesn't move through the soil very quickly. So it will hold on to water, it causes a lot of root rots, it also holds on to a lot of nutrients. So um, it can hold on to iron. So we'll see problems with iron in our trees. Um, so if you've got um, clay soil, you can amend your soil. That's probably the best thing that you can do is bring in mulch and compost and you can amend that soil. You can take a tiller and you can till that into your soil in the top six inches. We don't want to establish like very um, strong layers, like just putting that top soil right on top of the clay, we want to mix it in. If we just put it on top, then we won't have any drainage. Because that's kind of what she was asking, right? Should I have the clay soil and then something new on the top? But you're saying to really I'm saying to mix improve it the soil by, mm -hmm. by mixing, mixing it, it changing together. the composition. Yeah, so if you bring in topsoil and mix it together, the best thing you could do if you've got raised, or if you've got the opportunity to build raised beds is to build those and put your garden in those. That takes care of the whole soil problem. You can add a great fluffy soil, and um, you don't even have to deal with the clay, and you don't need that barrier between. Yeah. It gives you great drainage, and you're fine that oh, way. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, so welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Thank, Thank you. So for glad being that here. you're here. Um, oh, Erica said that ants ate her radishes. It can happen. I'm if they're hungry, they'll they'll find something to eat. So that's where we use those baits. Um, so yeah, if they find something that they like in your garden, they will they will go after we'll it. Eat it. Um, usually they're not much of a problem though. Okay, so our next question is from Linda Skeen. She said, will 20% vinegar kill creeping Virginia weeds? If not, what will? Okay, so vinegar is something that keeps popping up in the organic world. Um, and what it is is the acetic acid that you put on the plants and it burns the foliage on the plant. So it doesn't work on something that's like a perennial plant that has perennial root systems that will come back like Virginia creeper. Um, so. What you want to do with the Virginia creeper is you want to cut that plant at the base because it's it's creeping, it's growing, it's hard to um, spray something like that because it's up into the air. So you want to cut it at the base and then you're going to paint it with the strongest form of like glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup that you can find. And that should be taken down into the roots if you paint it immediately after cutting. And then um, that should kill okay. the roots. Okay, so does it work to just pull Virginia creeper? You can pull it, but it does have that perennial root system, so it may send up new shoots. Come back. Okay. All right. So we've got lots of questions coming in, and we're gonna kind of repeat this throughout just as we have new people joining us. Keep sending us your questions. We may not get to them today because we collected some questions earlier this week, but stay tuned on our Facebook page. We'll be doing more calls for questions. We'll get to as many as we can today, and we will do another Facebook Live next Friday. For sure. So our next question is from Paula Madsen. She said, I haven't had plums on my tree for two years now. It froze last year, but wasn't cold enough this year to freeze. Any idea why? Also, when do, oh, let's start with that question. She okay. has a follow-up question. All right. Um, so there's a few reasons why you might not have plums on your tree, and that is sometimes plums need a tree that will pollinate it. That tree is called a pollinizer. It, it provides a source of pollen. Um, so if you have the type of plum that needs a pollinizer, you may need to plant another tree. 
so that it has that so that you can pollinate to even get fruit. Another reason is that maybe it was raining when the, the blooms were open and our bees weren't out and we didn't get very good pollination, so then we don't get good fruit set. Um, another reason, and this is probably the most common reason, is that we have these late spring frosts. And when our bloom is open, if it dips to about 28 degrees, we can lose all of the blossom, which makes it so we don't get any fruit on our trees um, later in the year. So it's probably that we got a late spring freeze um, without seeing your property and seeing where your tree is placed, it's kind of hard for me to tell you exactly why. Um, but pollination is one of them. Um, late spring freezes are one of them. Um, so yeah, that's kind okay. of, yeah. Okay. And her follow-up question is, um, when do plums get in season in the Salt Lake area? I was too late last year and couldn't find any. So late summer, and the best place for you to grab some plums is at one of the farmer's markets. So um, go to your farmer's markets, ask when their plum trees are gonna be on, um, make sure that you're there for those weeks, and just frequenting those farmer's markets, knowing your farmers helps you get right. access to some of that stuff. And like we said earlier, the farmer's market here at the Botanical Center will start on July 12th. So well, if you're in the Kaysville area, that's a great place to come find your in-season fruits and veggies. And if you just wanna take a trip and visit the Botanical Center, the farmer's market would farmer's market would be a great place. It's a great night to come visit. visit. Okay, our next question we have is from Tiana Hawks. She said, "What can we do for blight and apple trees? We've pruned, sprayed commercially, continue to prune it out. Anything else to try?" And we had this similar question from um, Brittany Condy, and she asked not just about apple trees, but pear trees, roses, and elderberries. Okay, so blight is something that we've had a big problem with this year, specifically. Um, a disease called fire blight. It's a bacterial disease um, and it can spread to plants in the rose family. So what you're seeing on the elderberry, the elderberry is not in the rose family. That's a different prob problem. Um, so this spreads through natural openings in the plant. So when we have a blossom that's open, there's this natural opening um, for bacteria to enter into the plant. So this happens when we're in full bloom on our, on our apple trees, on our pear trees, on our roses and we'll have a storm and we'll be above 50 degrees. And that kind of sets us up for a really good fire blight season. And we've had it just terribly this year. So what you need to do is you need to prune out any of the infections. So if you see, what you'll see is you'll see blackened um, leaves or dark brown leaves, and then you'll see this kind of shepherd's crooking on the tips of your shoots. And it just kind of has that shepherd crook look. Um, you can also see oozing from the leaves and on the fruit. Um, if you see any of this on a tree that is susceptible to fire blight, you need to prune it out immediately and you need to cut six to 12 inches below the infection and you'll cut that out. You want to dip your pruners in a 10% solution of bleach after each cut so that as you go through your orchard, if you've touched you're any of the fire blight, you're not reinfecting. Um, you can also, I know some people that if they have late blooming trees, they will go through and they'll take some of the bloom off. You know, if we're going to have a storm and they don't want to have the fire blight. Um, also, suckers at the base of the tree, if you see these suckers coming up from the roots, those are a source of fire blight often. So they will okay. get fire blight, they will become that source that spreads it to the orchard. So you can cut all of those out of your orchard. Um, you have to do that every year, cutting those out. And then you can use resistant varieties, things like um, apples like Zestar, Empire, Prima, Red Delicious, Honeycrisp, John of Old, Wine Sap. These are all resistant varieties. Oh, and Liberty as well. Um, unfortunately with the pears there's not as many resistant varieties um, and the ones that we like to grow like the Bartlett's are, are highly Very susceptible. Simple. So those are a few things that you can do. Okay so so um, like I said um, Brittany Condi had a similar question and she asked about roses and elderberries. Are those um, plants that get fire blight? Roses can. Absolutely roses can. So and if you see something like this on your roses you're going to want to um, prune it out. Fortunately roses bloom a little bit later, so we don't see some of the same problems as frequently with roses as okay. we do with things like apples and pears. Elderberry, what you're probably seeing um, is a different disease. Um, they're susceptible to things like verticillium wilt. I would have to see a picture of, of right. the elderberry to actually diagnose it. But okay. Yeah, it's a different disease on the elderberry. Okay, so I noticed in the last week, this, this seems like it's been a common problem like you said, this year it's been a bad year for fire blight. Yes. And one of our other gardening experts, Judy Gunnell, posted just about this exact thing on our USU Extension Yard and Garden Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are tuned in, if you are not following that page, you definitely should go check it out if you're into gardening. We post tons of great resources there from our experts. Um, lots of good info really good on stuff. that page. 
So if you follow the Yard and Garden page, give us a thumbs up. I want to see how many of you are following that page. Um, all right, let's move on to our next question. Jen Greenwood says, I'm having a huge problem with grasshoppers in my garden. And I noticed um, oh, one of the one. live comments was asking about grasshoppers. She said, I'm looking for recommendations for sprays or baits. We live about 7,000 feet, above 7,000 feet. Park City area. I'm thinking in neighbors. A, yeah, there. in an area with little landscaping and mostly pinion, juniper, and sage and native plants surrounding a fenced garden area. Second year garden and grasshoppers were a huge problem last year as well. Okay, so grasshoppers can be a problem and they're really hard to control because they do move. So if you're going to control a population, as soon as you control it, they move in from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So this becomes really hard. Um, you can use some um, chemicals to treat. There's seven, malathion and permethrin, which includes things like spectracide, basic solutions, bonide, and gordons. Um, and then there are some um, other things that are registered for grasshoppers um, that are baits. So this would attract the grasshopper, it would eat it, and then it would die. And these are things like deadline bug bait, um, Lily Miller grasshopper, um, and then EcoBran, and 7.5. And then there is a NOLO biological bait. And this is a great thing if you're looking to be organic. And I think that the question on Facebook was an organic question. So NOLO is like a fungus that infects the grasshopper and the fungus eats the grasshopper basically from the inside out. Um, so it attacks it and it kills it that way. And that is an organic, it's found in nature. Um, it's not something that somebody chemically created or right. you know, Frankenstein made right. in some lab. So um, if you're looking for organic, NOLO works great. Okay. Great, great tips for grasshoppers. Okay, this next one is, is a funny question, but a real problem for a lot of people. It's from <laughs> Diana Tracy. She says, cats poop all over my vegetable garden. How can I get rid of them? Oh, this one is, this one's hard because cats just kind of have a mind of their own. <laughs> um, so there are some sprays that you can pick up. There's like cataway sprays that you can pick up on, on online stores. I've seen them there. Um, probably the best thing to do is to get rid of the dirt that they can dig in. So you're going to plant things. Um, so putting down things that, that cover the soil so that they can't dig is kind of um, a big thing. Um, they don't like some of the herbs, so things like rue and lavender, they don't like the smell of it. They hate peppermint. Um, the peppermint's invasive, so if you're going to plant that, just be aware. You, you need put to some pots of peppermint, pots of peppermint something like that. that. Um, they don't like the scent of citrus either, so I've heard that you can take your citrus peels and put them in the garden, mm -hmm. and that kind of deters them. Um, if I've got a place where a cat is digging, so I have cats at my house, um, I live where there's, you know, big open places. We have our cat, plus we have a lot of roaming cats in the area. Um, and if they continue to dig in a spot, I'll just take like a, um, like a wicker basket or something made out of willows that I've woven and just kind of stick it over that area. It kind of deters them, gets them to move to a new area, which is hopefully not like in my yard. there's one area yeah, that there's one spot that to. they keep going. Um, then I'll do something like that. They'll usually find another spot somewhere else that I hope is in someone else's yard. Right. So right. that's horrible to say. Okay, so you is. said like things that cover, cover the ground so they mm -hmm. can't dig. What would you do in a vegetable garden? Like, so, are you thinking more yeah. on like your landscape? Or? I was thinking more, that's like a landscape thing with the vegetable garden. That's why I use like a willow something okay. or, you know, just like a cloche or something over that area to just cover it long enough to get the cats to move on. So, right. Or the got, deterrence yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah. As well. That one's hard. Because <laughs> even if you the, can't control a cat, you can say get rid of the cats. But if they're not your cat, you can't do that. You can't do anything. And if you love them, you shouldn't get rid of them. And you've heard the term herding cats, right? Yes. It's like impossible. Yes. Right. Okay. So our next question is from Barbara Duncan. She says, My Rose of Sharon never blooms. It has lots of buds. What do you suggest? Okay, so this is a common problem with Rose of Sharon. I was I was looking at this yesterday. I was kind of um, filtering through the questions and um this happens a lot. So this happens when we don't have full sun on the Rose of Sharon. That's one of the problems that can cause it. Um, also, if it has um, any kind of stress, so if it's got any kind of drought, which is really common in our area, so maybe it's not getting deep watered. So taking a hose and putting that hose and letting it trickle for a couple hours okay. per day, just letting that water sink way down into the roots will really help. Um, so anything that stresses it out will um, cause it to have buds that never open and it doesn't put its energy into flowering instead it will just kind of hold everything back. So Barbara, deep watering. Yes. 
With the Try host. that. With the host. Try that. <laughs> okay, we've got some new people joining us. Hello, Jen Greenwood and Gina and Sally. We're so glad you're joining us today. Um, we're just moving through our questions. Please feel free to submit questions in the comments, and we will um, work through those. If we don't have time to get them, get to them today, we'll get to them next week. We're going to be live again on Friday with answering more gardening questions. Yes. So our next question is from Jim Powell. He said, "Can you can you find? Oh, this was the tricky question. Right. So be careful when you're submitting questions. Yep. Make sure that you're typing things clearly because sometimes there are typos and we can't figure out what you're asking. So he was asking about peach trees, I think maybe daylilies. Daylilies and gladiolas, but we're so not exactly I'm sure. I'm not exactly what sure asking. what Jim was asking, but Jim, if you're here, if you tune in, I did ask a follow-up question. If you want to respond to me, I'd be happy to answer that question for you. Okay. Shout out to Jim. Okay. Let us know what your question is and we'll get to it. Okay. okay. We'll move on to a question from Megan Talon. She said, is there anything I can do about bindweed? Short of moving. It's in the lawn, <laughs> it's in the flower beds. And we had a very similar question from Linda Hansen. She referred to it as morning glory, right? Um, the bad kinds. Mm -hmm. So maybe could you kind of clarify what yeah. you meant by that? Yeah. So a lot of people refer to this um, noxious weed that we have in Utah as morning glory, and um, that's because it's very closely related to an actual plant called morning glory that is not invasive. Um, you can plant it from seed. It can trellis. It's actually really pretty. It's beautiful and it will reproduce by seed. But the bindweed that we have here reproduces a couple different ways. So it will reproduce by seed, and then it has um, it has these roots that will um, send up new shoots, and it will send up new shoots all along the roots. So it's very difficult to control. Um, it can be, I think it's the devil <laughs> myself. Raise your hand if you so also have problems with bindweed. It is so difficult to control. So there are some things that you can do. And the thing that you need to remember is that you have to be persistent. It's okay. going to take, it's not a quick fix. It's going to take a long time to get rid of. If it's in your lawn, um, in the spring and in the fall, you can hit it with a broadleaf weed killer called 2,4-D. That's okay. the active ingredient in, in the weed killer. And you can't use it once our temperatures are above 85 degrees, so you will not want to be using it right now because we've spiked in our temperatures. If we're above 85 degrees, it does what's called volatilizing, where it kind of turns into a vapor, and it will move around your yard and kind of go to the lowest point, and as it moves, it kills everything that's broadleaf. So you don't want to use that when it's hot. So is that a common, I'm going to ask you an on-the-fly question, okay. so you can say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, is that a common ingredient? A lot of people treat their lawns with like a weed and feed in the fall. Is yes. 2,4-D one of those? 2,4-D is usually in something that is Components? a weed and feed. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we use it in the spring and the fall and we don't use it in the summer. Okay. So in the spring and the fall, that's what you will hit it with. You'll um, use something with that active ingredient. You'll go over your lawn. It will not kill your lawn and it will just kill the broadleaf weeds like morning glory. Now if it's not in your lawn, if it's in an area where there's not plants around it, um, you can hit it with um, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. There are some other um, chemicals out there that have combinations where they use dicamba or 2,4-D with the glyphosate, and you can hit it with something like that. Um, just be aware if there's a combination that you're using, watch the temperature. Um, Roundup or glyphosate will kill your lawn, and it will kill any other plant that it comes in contact with, so just be careful. So the thing I found with bindweed is that you have to hit it over and over and over again. So you're going to hit it in spring, maybe a couple times, in the fall, maybe a couple of times. It's great to hit it in the fall after we've had our first little frost because the waxy cuticle is gone on the plant and it okay. takes it down into the roots deeper than it would any other time of the year. Okay. And then mechanical pulling, going out and pulling it. So as that, plant, yeah, as that plant sits in the sun, it is collecting carbohydrates and it's putting those into the roots. And what we want to do is weaken the plant. So we don't want it to collect sunlight. We don't want it to put the carbohydrates in the roots. So just repeated weeding, okay. repeated spraying. I heard someone, I heard the recommendation once that you should, instead of trying to pull it, you should just like cut, cut it, it off. Mm -hmm. Is that true? So yeah, if you pull it and you don't get all the roots and the roots break apart, you've just created more new plants. So you can cut it if you'd like. I usually take a, a weeder and just stuff the top of it. Hmm. And that basically cuts it the same way you would. And then I pick it up. I don't let it sit in the ground because it can, um, it can reproduce root. from, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. if there's any stem left. It can reroot in the right conditions if it's got soil, moisture. Oh, yeah. So no lazy weeding. No lazy weeding. With fine weed. So yeah, okay. it's the devil. Okay. I hope that answered some of your questions about bindweed being 
you know, getting rid of the devil plant. Okay. <laughs> Our next question is from Nancy Christensen. She says, I have a six-year-old wisteria that has grown and appears healthy, but it has never bloomed. What can I do to encourage bloom next spring? Okay, so this happens a lot on wisteria. Um, I've actually had this experience myself where I have this great big wisteria and no bloom. Oh. And you're like, hey, I've put so much time, so much effort into you. I would really like to enjoy some bloom. Um, so usually this means that we've got a lot of nitrogen and we don't have enough phosphorus. Okay. So if she wants to um, give that plant a good dose of a phosphorus fertilizer. So if you look on the fertilizer bag, there's three um, numbers. And the first one's nitrogen. Um, or nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So you're looking at that middle number and you want the middle number to be high. So okay. something that has um, a high middle number is what you're looking I for. I just had an experience, not with wisteria, I was looking at something to help my hydrangeas mm -hmm. and notice that there are some fertilizers that will really help do the greenery, but you have to specifically look for one with that high phosphorus so you can get blooms. Right, so phosphorus so. supports blooms um, and where nitrogen supports uh, more of the leaf growth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you guys for submitting some more questions. And hello to those of you who have just tuned in. I see a few of you have come. Oh, um, some AFID questions. They're bad this been year. tons of AFID questions. They're so bad. We're going to work through yep. our pre-collected questions. And then I think that's one we should address at the end yep. a little bit. Yeah. If we have some time. For sure. So our next question is from Lynn Hinkley. She says, what would cause a Zelkova, Zelkova tree to be chlorotic? on just one third of the tree. Okay, so um, zelkovas usually don't get chlorosis, but it can happen. Um, they're very well adapted to our environment um, here in Utah, so they make a great landscape tree here. Um, when we have chlorosis, we can either see it on the whole tree, and sometimes we only see it on part of the tree. Maybe we only see it on two or three branches. Um, so if you have a zelkova that is chlorotic, it's likely that it's getting a lot of water. So maybe um, assess your water situation, make sure that you're not overwatering. Um, and in the spring, like around March, you can add some chelated iron. And that's the kind of iron that we need in our soils here in Utah. So um, add, add a good dose of chelated iron to the tree. It's the F-E-E-D-D-H-A type of iron. Okay. It's such a long acronym, but um, that's the type of iron that you would need. Okay, and you were talking about this in our clay soil question, right? right. That clay really holds on to those nutrients and then the trees or their plants get chlorosis because they are not getting the iron right? right right and it just it basically makes a tug of war for the tree okay hi margaret thanks for tuning in um our next question is from amy holtz she said all the vegetables and vegetables in my garden are turning yellow they are in grow boxes i amend the soil each year what what to do what to do this is a hard one i mean because you you've done all this work you've built to raise yeah. beds, you've put in this great soil, you're amending it. Um, I would recommend a soil test for you um, to just kind of look at the soil and see what you've got going on in the soil. And you can do that at your local extension office or you can go online if you go to the usual usual.usu.edu site. Um, you can print the forms for a soil test and you can just send it in yourself and you don't have to make the extra trip to the extension office if you don't want, but we're happy to help you either way. Um, so if you do that soil test, we can kind of look at it and see what's going on. Um, my question for you would be, what are you amending with? Um, tell me more about what um, type of soil you started with. If you've got soil that has a lot of not broken down organic material, so like a lot of leaves, a lot of wood chips, sometimes to break those down, they'll hog the nitrogen mm -hmm. in the soil. And so okay. your plants won't get the nitrogen that they need. So what would be a better alternative to amend the soil? Um, compost is great. Um, if you use a really well composted uh, mix, is a great thing to amend with. Um, you you can amend with um, with wood chips if you want. Just make sure they're broken down really small, and you want to do it in the fall and give it enough time to break down before the spring. Or you put your plants in. And sometimes if you're going to add that and it's a lot, we want to add um, some nitrogen with it to kind of help it break down so that there is available right. nitrogen. Right. Okay. All right, our next question is from Mickey Easton. She says, oh, she's got, this is a three-part question. This is a three-part, yeah, I remember this one. Part one, how do I properly prune a catalpa tree? Okay, part one. Um, so you're going to follow this basic rule where you prune out anything that's dead, diseased, dying, broken, rubbing, and crossing. That's where you start on something like a catalpa tree. Okay, what is a catalpa tree? Okay, so a catalpa tree is a beautiful tree. It's like a very stately tree. They get very tall. And they're in bloom right now, and they're gorgeous. They have these white 
bloom, like white bloom all over the tree. And then they'll put on these long bean pods. <gasps> I've seen them. You know, okay, yeah. Yes, so and they're on the kind long of a pods. quick, a quick growing they tree. They are a right? faster growing tree, and they do get quite tall. Um, but when they're when they're full grown, they kind of have these these layers to the canopy, and they're just beautiful. They're gorgeous. So there's a lot of people that use them in their landscape because mm -hmm. of that. So, um, so yeah, just dead, diseased, dying, broken. Um, rubbing or crossing anything going in towards the center of the tree. A catalpa tree doesn't require a lot of pruning because it will naturally um, go to the form that it wants okay. to go, that it should be pruned to. Um, so just taking care of those few things. Um, if you've got, so we've got our main trunk, and if you have more than one main trunk up at the top, um, you want to select one because okay. you do want one single point of growth in right. the tree. That's the the only other thing I would do in the catalpa. Okay. And I will follow up and say we have so many pruning videos on we our do. USU Extension YouTube channel. Um, and I know every year we have some awesome pruning classes. We do. Um, they're usually in early spring. Mm -hmm. Is it too late to prune a catalpa tree? Um, no, I mean, you, you would do your, your majority of your pruning when the tree's dormant. But if you've got a problem in the tree that you need to take care of, you can take care of it. And um, okay. just be very careful. Don't ever cut out more than a third of the tree. Um, really light pruning now is probably the best for okay. the tree. So if you want to learn more about pruning, definitely stay tuned next spring for those pruning classes as they come up. And our pruning classes are great. It's a great way to see. It's one thing to read about something, but it's another thing to actually see someone do it live. And, and, and then go home and do it, and yourself. Do it yourself. And that kind of ferments it into your brain. Yes. Okay. Oh, Claire says, this is really great. Thank you so much, Thanks, Claire. We're Claire. glad that you're here. Um, we have a few more questions to get to. So, oh, part two of Mickey's question. Is it too late to move rose bushes? Okay, so we've hit that time of the year where we've got high temperatures, and I wouldn't be moving my rose bushes right now um, unless I absolutely had to. If you do have to move it right now, make sure that you um, maybe cut back the growth a little bit so that it doesn't have so much foliage to support. Um, and then give it a ton of water. And you're going to have to water every single day. Make sure that it doesn't get dried out because it's going to go through this kind of shock phase. Yeah. Um, if you can wait till fall, that's a much better time to move your rose bush. Right. Yeah. Okay, good advice. And the last part of Mickey's question says, I'm a proud owner of a crop of peach borer. Yay! The tree is <laughs> three yay. years old. I removed more than you care to know and applied poison as directed. How do I know if they're really gone or if I need to keep watching? Okay, so you do need to keep watching. So they will come back. Um, peach tree borers are, are a problem that we have here in Utah. And they enter, there's two different kinds. There's a twig borer, and then there's a greater peach tree borer that enters at the bottom, at the base of the trunk. And I am thinking that it's probably the one that enters at the base. That's the one we have the most problems with. Um, so for chemical controls, she'll want to keep applying that chemical control because they can come back, they will reinvest the tree, um, just make sure that you're staying on top of it. And you can subscribe to our pest advisories. They'll give you dates for application of these types of chemicals for specific pests. And peach tree borer is on there. And you can sign up for those at pestadvisories, that's I-E-S, dot U-S-U dot E-D-U. And you just go to subscribe, and you can subscribe to the advisories that you would like. There's one for lawns, there's one for vegetables, one for fruit, one for landscape trees. And um, that will kind of keep you on top of all of those different things. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from Brandy Yates. She says, we can't seem to get any large tomatoes to grow. We've tried multiple different types in different soils. We can get small tomatoes like cherry to grow in an abundance in abundance, but never larger ones. Any suggestions? So my suggestion to you, again, comes back to fertilizer. Um, and it may be that your plant doesn't have enough phosphorus to support that root growth, which is really important for tomatoes. If you've got lots of nitrogen, you're going to get huge tomato plants, but you're not going to get a lot of fruit. So if you want to give it a good dose of phosphorus, see if that helps. Make sure that you're watering evenly, the plant isn't stressed, and um, you should be okay. Tomatoes are self-fruitful, so um, the pollination usually isn't an issue on tomatoes. Okay, so probably nutrients in this Probably soil. nutrients is my guess. So would you recommend a soil test for that? You can do a soil test if you would like. It will tell you what the phosphorus and the potassium are in your soil. <clears throat> and then you, we can kind of go from there and work work through it if you need to. Okay. So that's that usual .usu.edu, or you can come to the extension office. Okay. And going to your extension office, that's like the best thing you could do, I think, because then you can yeah. um, really kind of help 
the agent can help you because you'll be able to give them kind of the full picture of what's going on. Right. And then they can better troubleshoot what, what problem you're having. We also have diagnostic clinics with Master Gardeners. So next week, um, we've just been doing them on Thursdays, but next week we start Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you have questions, problems, bring them in on Tuesday or Thursday morning between 9 and noon, and we will have Master Gardener experts. We have four here at a time. They're really excited to help you. We have a fantastic group of Master Gardeners with yeah. a great knowledge base. And that's here in Davis County yep. um, at the USU Botanical Center. But you can look at your county right. website or call your county office, um, USU Extension County office, and find out when when their diagnostic right. desk is open. Every, every county is a little different, so. Yep. yep, okay, this next one is fun. We have something to show you. Oh, good. It's from Dallin Barker. He says, what is this? And he posted a picture, and we brought a live example. This way. Um, <laughs> it appeared in my dark garden two years ago, and every time I weed, I feel like I come back, and it's doubled. We couldn't quite show you the picture. I don't know. There we go. Help? I, don't help? Know. I don't know. So this is purslane. And um, in my book of weeds, this one's high up there for badness. Um, it comes back um, quickly. It grows really fast. And when it seeds, it puts out a ton of seeds. And um, those seeds are viable for up to 40 years in the soil. So if you have a seed bank in your soil that some nice person left you a generation ago, you can thank them. <laughs> um, so how to get rid of it. They're very easy to pull. So they have a pretty shallow root, you can see here, um, just a really small root. They're very easy to pull. Um, you want to pull them before they flower and set seed. And the flowers are small. They're very discreet. So you have to kind of look for it. So um, as soon as you see that one, as soon as you pull, see it it out. pull it out. Um, um, how can people, I know that sometimes people get confused on what's purslane and what's like a spurge or something right. else. How can they tell if it's purslane? So spurge has a milky sap. So if you were to snap this, you would see like a milky sap coming out of the stem. So this doesn't have that. This is purslane. Purslane's also got these really thick, fleshy kind of succulent leaves on it. And um, you can eat this. I, I don't. I don't eat it, but no, you could. <laughs> Some people don't consider it a weed. They think it's they edible. You can, and you can use edible. it in salad, so you can pull this and you can make a salad with it, or you can pull it. I feed it to my horse a lot, so he likes it. Um, but yeah, just don't let it go to seed. Um, you can use a, something like glyphosate on it that also works. Um, where it has that thick kind of succulent stem, it's a little bit difficult to control with chemicals. So okay. hand pulling. Elbow grease. But it's easy it to pull. It is easy. It's very easy to pull. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to remind you, if you're enjoying this video, please share it. Give it a like. We'd love to have more people join us and, and get some more gardening questions. So our next question is from Marlene Miyazaki. She says, how can I keep the neighbor's dog out of my garden? She keeps digging it up and makes a huge mess. All right. Well, Robert Frost said that fences make good neighbors. <laughs> And I truly believe that. Um, so this is a hard one. I, this comes back to talking to your neighbor about controlling their dog, making sure that they stay in their yard. Um, planting you know, bushes where they normally dig, I don't know if that's something you can do. It just kind of depends on your yard landscape. Um, but if that, if that little pooch is determined to dig um, and be unleashed and no fence, um, there's not a lot you can do. So this, this comes down to good neighbors. So yeah. talk to your neighbors. Um, there are some sprays that can kind of help deter, and I know that if you're living in a community that doesn't have fences, that they make those um, fences that you can use on collars that you don't oh, see. They're right. like um, those fences that you just, they're not visible. So and it just kind of keeps the dog kind of contained. So some, suggesting that. something like that to your neighbor, taking them cookies to tell them, hey, your dog is driving me crazy. Oh, Please do goodness. something about it. Um, it's a hard conversation to have sometimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. So we had an online live course a couple weeks ago about succulents, we and we talked about cactuses. We'll oh. share it in. <laughs> we Maybe could. you should plant some cacti plant, to yes. deter the dust. So that would be really pear. mean. That would be, yeah, you could plant prickly pear, but I wouldn't recommend it. That, that would be so sad. A fence would probably be a better idea. A fence idea. would be good, yeah. Um, okay, our next question is from Diane Dahl. She says, my roses have gotten so big and tall, how much can I trim them without hurting or ruining them? Okay, so there's a couple of kind of types of roses that um, we prune a little bit differently. So if we've got these um, shrub or bush type roses, we don't prune them quite as heavily. Um, if you've got the grandiflora or the floribunda rose, um, you can prune those ones a little bit more heavily. So you're going to leave um, 
a couple of the canes each year, so like five canes each year. The rest of them you're going to prune out, the oldest ones, and then you can take the height down when you prune. And this is done early in the spring um, when you just start to see the buds on the rose is when you're going to prune. Um, there is a great online video on rose pruning that J.D. Gunnell and Jerry Goodspeed did that you can look up and you on can our see. YouTube channel. Yep, and you can see that one. That one goes through um, pruning roses pretty well. Um, but the time to control the height is when you prune. So, um, so is it too late now? Yeah, I don't prune my roses now. Um, once you cut a rose, so roses are susceptible to almost every problem out there. So they're because they're of, highly cultivated. Yes, right? and they're very they're like the prima donnas of the horticulture world. So. Um, when you cut into a rose when it's warm outside you're kind of just asking for problems so that's why it's important to do it when the plant is dormant the buds are just starting to swell and we even recommend sealing some of your cuts with like a wood glue okay so that um you know things can't enter right. into the rose at that point we have some beautiful rose gardens up at the ogden botanical Me gardens and um, so if you live in the wasatch front area and want to take a drive to a beautiful beautiful garden i would definitely take a look up there those gardens are gorgeous they are gorgeous and kind of a hidden gem um for sure and i i believe they do a rose pruning class in the spring they as do. well mm -hmm. so any pruning classes pay attention in the spring that's when those happen and they often fill up really quickly so mm -hmm. so stay on top of that and that's love to have you come okay Moving on, our next question is from Erica Youngberg. She says, what is the best inexpensive or DIY mulch for vegetable gardens? Okay, there are lots of different mulches that you can use that are free. So you can use um, leaf mulch is a great mulch. So you can just kind of collect those leaves in the fall, let them sit, you know, in bags or however you want to want to keep them through the winter. And then you can use them in the spring and just add them around your plants. You can use straw. If you have access to straw that's clean, that doesn't have a lot of weed seed in it, that's a great mulch. It will cost you a little bit to get the straw, but it is it, it is a nice mulch. It spreads really nicely, helps keep the water in. Um, you can also use grass clippings. Um, just let them dry a little bit before you put them in the garden so you don't get this big slimy yeah. grass um, breaking down. So you just let it dry for a day and then add it to your garden afterwards. Right. So and is that mulch you can just leave on top? Yep, mulch that you okay. would just leave on top. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see we have a question. Stephanie, we saw your question earlier. Um, we talked a little bit about pests, but we're, we've got more questions still. And if we don't get to all the live questions today, we have been going for 40 minutes now and we still have a few left. So if we don't get to everything today, we are doing another live video next week and we'll work through the comments on this live video and we will, we will we'll address make you sure we sure. get an answer to you. Yes. Um, our next question is from Amy Paulson. She said, we transplanted our strawberry plants and we have tons of red, beautiful, sour strawberries. <laughs> How and then she had some face emojis, but yeah. I won't try and recreate those. <laughs> How can I get them to sweeten up? They're in raised beds, nurtured soil, covered with white shade cloth, plenty of water. Sounds like she's really big being these She is very in strawberries, which is good. Um, so my hunch is that the shade cloth is what's keeping your strawberries from becoming really sweet. So the way that plants um, get sugar into the fruit is through the sun. So strawberries need full sun, six to eight hours of full sun, um, and they'll collect those carbohydrates, they'll take those carbohydrates and put them into the fruit. And then as the fruit ripens, those carbohydrates break apart from long chains to short chains, and they become what we taste as sugar in the fruit. You guys didn't know you were going to get a science lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's one of those things, they have to have that sunlight to get all of the sweetness. So okay, develop that sugar. Yeah, I would take the shade cloth off. I think everything else she's doing is fantastic. So okay, okay, because strawberries like a little bit of shade. They right? do. They well, do. And maybe some protection from like birds and right, right. But if you want them sweet, if you want them sweet, they've got to have some sun. Um, and it depends on the percentage of shade cloth that you're using too. So right. my guess is it's a little bit higher shade cloth. Um, I would just take it off for a while while I let the strawberries ripen, and then harvest and you're See good. Okay. Yeah. All right, this next question is from Bella Stone. She says, are there any iPhone Apple applications, so apps, right. that you can use to identify crops such as vegetables? I've only found applications for flower identification. Right, so there are a lot of apps out there. There's some for trees and they're they're based on the leaf shape. And then there's some for flowers based on, you know, that flower that you see. And that's how we identify um, most of our plants is through the flower. So that's where the flower ones come in and they're they're really important and handy in identifying um, the plants that you have. Um, there's one called Garden Answers Plant ID and this one uses mostly photos to ID 
but it is done through flour. So in a lot of our, our vegetables, we don't ever like get to the flour stage. So we may not be able to ID some of them. Um, there is like a green or a... Right. It, we may not get there with that with that particular plant um, if we send a photo. There is one called Plantifier, and that one's a, a crowdsource recogni recognition tool. So you basically send in a photo, and they have a community that looks at what you sent in, and they will see if they can identify it. Right. There are also some great resources on Facebook. So I know that there's a ton of Facebook pages, like there's Utah Homesteaders. There's groups. Ask, or, yeah, yeah, groups. groups. Yeah, Ask a Utah Expert Gardener. Um, I see it all the time where people will post a picture and say, what is this? We've got our yard and garden page that we would happily answer um, identification questions on. So And your county yeah. office. Yeah, we can it's help. It's not an app, but it's it's a really great resource. Right. Um, that diagnostic desk. They are, if you bring in a sample, they're they're very helpful and really knowledgeable. And we do have um, an email for our diagnostics um, laboratories with our master gardeners. So, and I believe it's USU um, hotline. I, I'll find it and I'll post it. We'll share it in the and, at Gmail. And you can always send a photo and um, we can try and identify it that way as well. Okay. Next is from Rebecca Everett. She says, how can I get rid of white top without killing my little orchard? Okay, first tell us what so white hard. top is. Okay, so white top is a mustard plant and it um, shows up early in the spring. Um, it, it grows rather quickly and it can get pretty tall. Um, it's horrible because it reproduces both by sending out seeds and it produces new plants from the roots. And I read that it can produce up to 400 new plants from the roots of a single oh plant. Gosh. So, and it's it's a really bad plant. Yeah. Um, it's up there with morning glory. It's very hard to control because of the extensive root system that it has. So what you need to do with this, um, one of the best methods is to mow it and then immediately spray it with um, something that will kill it, like glyphosate, 2,4-D, um, a combination, something that will get right into that stem that you just cut and be translocated down into the roots. Right. Because that's a rhizome root, right? And, yeah, it just has it has these roots that spread and come up new plants everywhere. Okay. It's it's very hard to control. And I feel so sad about your orchard. <laughs> right. So another great resource on White Top, one of our other gardening experts, uh, Ron Patterson, just did a YouTube video on our YouTube channel uh, about how to control White Top. Yeah. And he talked about this kind of some more organic methods, right. which may not be as effective as you would want. They involve a lot more work. Um, so digging things up, um, removing all, the, all roots. the roots, which the root systems can be very extensive. So and he, hard. Yeah, and he also talks about prevention because that's, like, that's key. That's kind of the best thing you can do because once you've already got it, it sounds like it's really it's hard, hard to get rid of. Yeah. Um, so check out that YouTube video if you're interested in learning how to control white top. And Ron Patterson also has a ton of other great videos um, on gardening and small ag and he's great really at awesome. videos. He does a lot of them. Okay, we've just got a couple questions left. This one is from Brittany Condi. She said, what is the best way to get rid of raspberry crown borers? Okay, so raspberry crown borer is a clear winged moth and it kind of looks like a yellow jacket but it's a little bit fuzzy and it has larva so it will lay eggs and it will the eggs will hatch into larva and they will tunnel into the crowns of the raspberry plants and into the lower part of the cane and into some of the roots, which makes it hard to control because it's not up somewhere where we can really get to it. So the crown is the base of is the, the plant? base where the where the roots and the top of the plant come together okay. is the crown. Um, so you can it has a two year life cycle, which also makes it even more hard to control. Um, the best thing to do is to dig out the infested canes. So you're going to dig out that whole plant. You're going to get rid of it. You're going to go buy plants that don't have raspberry. Um, borers in them. Um, if you're going to do chemicals, you can apply some chemicals. Uh, you'll do it in mid-October because we're trying to target that first year larva and they kind of come up to the surface where we can kill them. They're in a state where we can actually kind of get to them um, in that mid-October time frame. Um, chemicals like carbaryl, malathion, um, pyrethrins, neem oils can be applied. And, and neem oil, oil, that's an organic, that is an organic way to do it. It kind of smothers the insect. Okay. So. Okay, and another question from Brittany. She says, what causes a bleeding heart to be white when it blooms? Okay, so there are bleeding hearts that are white. There's a variety called Alba that just comes white. So if you meant to buy a pink one or a red one at the nursery and they maybe accidentally labeled it wrong and sold you a white one, that would be what causes okay. it. So Raise your hand if you've seen a white bleeding heart. There's yes. my hands right there. 
I have never seen one in a garden, but I've seen them at the nursery. They're beautiful. Before. They're just slightly different than what you would expect yeah. if you were thinking you were getting a pink yes. one. Yes. <laughs> okay, can we talk about aphids for a minute? Yes, let's talk about aphids. So we've had major problems with aphids this year. Um, aphids are a soft-bodied insect. Um, we didn't get quite cold enough this last year. We didn't have enough mm. length in our in our cold season um, to kill them. So usually they die off in the winter and they're not as big of a problem as what we've seen. Um, Oh, it was pink last year. Hi, Brittany, you're here. So it was pink last year. That's really interesting. <laughs> we'll come right back to it. Um, so um, it didn't get cold enough. It didn't get cold enough. So if it's not cold enough, then we have this overwintering population that just booms when it's spring. Um, some of the ways that you can control them at home, because they're soft-bodied, they don't hang on to plants very easily, they crawl up, they like that new succulent growth. You can just spray them down with water. You can use a horticultural um, or an insecticidal soap um, will do the trick and just kind of get rid of them. Does the soap kill them? It does. Because if you just sprayed it with water, could they just crawl they back up? They can on? crawl back up. People that are organic like to do the water method, and it actually works really well. They're not a strong insect. Um, it takes them a long time to crawl. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but that, that insecticidal soap is a great alternative. Um, there are some uh, systemic um, insecticides that you can apply to plants. Um, make sure that they're registered for aphids um, on the label. Oh, and that's something else I should tell you guys. If you're going to use any kind of chemicals, make sure you follow all the label, label directions because the label's the law. And if you're doing some kind of dose that's not recommended on the label or if you're applying it too frequently and you know, not following the label directions, you're actually breaking the law and we don't want you to do that. So it makes it dangerous for you and yeah, people you around you. So, Especially if you're working like in an edible garden. Right. You just be careful. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so the, the aphids have been terrible, and I know we've had a lot of questions. Yeah. It seems like that's all I've answered. Some of the Facebook groups that you mentioned, I, I'm part of, and I've seen so many aphid questions, and I've seen aphids in my own yard, mm -hmm. green ones and black ones. Right, they come in all different colors. So there's pink ones, green ones, black ones, um, really light colored green that are almost, almost yellow looking. Mm -hmm. They come in all kinds of colors. So. And how they reproduce is they, they clone themselves and they give birth to live young. So they can reproduce very quickly and they can reproduce. That's kind of terrifying. Of yes, they're kind of creepy. <laughs> yes. Okay, so spraying them off an insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap is a great way to start. Yeah. Okay, what about like, um, do you ever recommend like introducing, like a lot of people will say, where can I go find ladybugs? Right, so ladybugs are something that they are a natural predator. Um, and especially in the, the um, nymph stage. So they kind of look like this red and black baby alligator and they have these big jaws and they are voracious when they're small. They want to eat as many aphids as possible. So they will go after the aphids. So um, you can put those in your yard. The problem with ladybugs is they fly. So they may or may not stick around. And um, they're not a native, are they a native bug um, to Utah? Uh, they're not, well, I, I don't even know the answer Well, to the reason I asked that, because I had an aphid problem last year, and I mm -hmm. went to our diagnostic desk in Salt Lake County and talked to one of the gardening experts there, and she said, because my first instinct was, oh, we'll go buy some ladybugs. Uh -huh. And she said, that's not the best way. I think she recommended insecticidal soap. Yeah. Um, they're, yeah. they're a great thing to have in your yard, because if you've got beneficials, you know that, you know, things are working, we've got good things in the yard, not just bad things, I haven't killed out everything, and I only have, you know, this resurgence of bad pests, it means you've got a good balance in your yard of, what, of the things that you're doing in your practices. So, um, to get them to stick around, you can um, water before you place them out in the garden, they, they're thirsty, so make sure that they um, have a source of water, so I, if I'm going to put them on my roses, I'll spray down my roses first, and then I'll sprinkle them. And then make sure that they have a food source, that there are enough aphids for them to eat or they will not stick around, they'll yeah. just leave. So I believe they're native to Asia. Okay. Is what there I'm thinking. Go. There you go. Um, okay, so I wanted to do maybe just this one question. You know, Stephanie actually posted a question before we went live, and so I kind of wanted to kind of right. talk through uh, her question. She said that she's got some bugs that are eating um, her beans, beets, and chard um, down to the stem. If you've got a, a bug problem in your garden, like what what are your first steps? What do you do to handle that? The first step is to find the bug. So we got to know what we're dealing with. That's really important for us to know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, so you can um, go out in the nighttime is usually when you'll find them. Make sure you're looking under leaves. Take a flashlight with you. Take your kids with you. They love to bug hunt. Um, 
my kids, that's like the best thing ever if we're going to go out bug hunting. Yes. Um, take that flashlight with you and flip over the leaves, see what you can find, um, put it all in a bag, bring it to the extension office, and we'll see if we can help you. Um, it's great to come on those diagnostic days because then you've got a whole bunch of brains working on trying to figure out what yeah. you've got in your garden. Um, so once you figure, once we figure out what it is, then we can kind of take some steps, um, you know, in moving towards getting rid of that pest in your garden. Um, my guess is with your stuff that you've got, maybe flea beetles, um, they put small holes in a lot of our fruits and vegetables. Um, we've had some problems with flea beetles this year, so it's likely that that is something that could be attacking your vegetables. And they attack a whole range of vegetables. Some are very specific to what they will eat, and some are not. Um, but yeah, getting that, that insect, bringing it into the office, we'll figure it out. Okay, great okay. advice. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Oh, you know what? We didn't get back to the bleeding heart. <gasps> the bleeding heart, we said we would. We Sorry about would. that, Brittany. Brittany. We will not forget. We will not forget you, Brittany. Um, so um, if it was pink last year and then it's white this year, um, it's likely that you have what's called a genetic sport. So sometimes plants will produce a shoot that will, that will look a little bit different mm -hmm. than what you see on the original plant that you bought. It happens all the time. So we'll just have a genetic variation or it will revert to um, a form that it, that it came from. It's just the genetics of the plant. So if you've got a section of it that's turning white or the whole thing is turned white, it's just it's reverting to those genetics or it has that, that one section that has reverted. Okay. So Okay. Well, and I've heard of other plants that change colors, but I've never, like hydrangeas, but I've never heard of a bleeding heart. Yeah, color. so it, it could be something like that. So, yeah, hopefully that helps. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank we you. Love seeing your comments and your interactions and getting to answer some of your questions. Um, like I mentioned before, we are doing this again next Friday at 10 o'clock. Um, so we'll go through the questions that, uh, that you submitted today, and we'll do another call for questions um, probably next week. And, and we'll do this again. So happy gardening. Yes, happy gardening. Happy gardening, and we hope to see you Thank next you guys. Friday as well. Bye. See ya.